to me, if I could deliver my own child, that would be the coolest thing I could ever do mm-hmm. as, a, as a father. I mean, I know there's a lot more things, but I mean, that's something that I, I fear. I have the fear of, mm-hmm. and, and here's where we get into it, is, is that on his final child, uh, she came out and the umbilical cord was wrapped around her neck. And he knew exactly what to do in that moment. I would freak out. I don't know about you, Dan. I would freak out a little bit. My initial reaction would probably be find it right above her head, cut it, and get it unwrapped. I mean, I don't know else. What, what would you, that's what I would do with a calf. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've I've birthed several uh, several calves on a, on a farm I used to work on, um, and a, a couple have come out breech or. Um, one did have the cord wrapped around. And you just cut it and you open up the airway as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's... so. The, in human midwifery, uh, we would just do a sort of somersault maneuver. If it's too tight, um, usually you can scooch it a little bit to loosen it up a little bit. If you clamp and cut, you're disrupting the oxygen supply. And oh, okay. what if you can't get the kiddo out? So midwifery right. model is you try to unwind, you know, un, um, wind the cord from around the neck. And if you can't do that, then you do this little somersault. Yeah. (laughs) But, uh, you know, to be fair, I mean, if that's your first birth that you're doing solo and that that happens, that you're allowed to freak out a little bit if you've not had a bunch of them underneath your belt. But that logic would would probably just if even if you did nothing else and you just kind of twerked the baby a little bit and (laughs) did a somersault, it'll loosen it up enough Mm -hmm. and, and to not disrupt the cord so that... If the kiddo needs helping, if you're having to open airway, mm-hmm. resuscitate in any way, they've got some guaranteed oxygen still coming through that cord. Mm-hmm. Right. So I know certainly what you mentioned, Dan, that's medical mm-hmm. management. Definitely. That's what docs routinely do. do. Routinely do it. Yeah. How, how often have you had to do anything like that with... Um, I never do that because... Uh, because not not the thinking, medical way. I'm mm-hmm. talking about. I'm just oh, saying. How, how often, often have you had? Do cord uh, entanglements yes. happen? Very frequently. Uh, quick story. It's certainly um, worth mentioning. If if a woman is particularly, it's very important for women to talk about their fears, just as with anything else, so it doesn't gain any power. Mm-hmm. And this is a biggie. This is something that a lot of women. You mentioned that Mandy worried, and and that was her her thing. That's her mo. Well, I think all pregnant women it's stated that the work of pregnancy is to worry. And so this is one of those things they meditate on. And so I have one client who um, we ended up having to do a surgical birth for her because the the baby was saying, help, help, help. And there was just definitely no way around. It was one of those rare indications. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you what, that it was probably entangled around five different, (laughs) it didn't have enough appendages, but around the (laughs) neck, around the leg, around, and it was a very long cord. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, in speaking to her, she said, you know, I knew that was going to happen. I worried about it every day. And so this is a case of, you have this very definite mind link with your baby and this is a definitely a case of your worry becoming your prayer that she meditated on that every day she admitted it and um, you can do the opposite you can have your wives think positive thoughts and imagine the baby and and you know the cord is free floating and the crystal clear fluids and no entanglements and when you're envisioning that then that's what happens Mm -hmm. you know you you definitely kind of uh, harvest what you sow there. Mm-hmm. You reap what you sow. Reap what you sow. We talked about C-sections. We talked about the negative impact of the C-section on the health tip. But can we talk about, I mean, and you talked about the ratio of C-sections, um, you know, versus no C-sections um, today. What I did want to talk about was... Um, C-sections as far as why are these women how does it work that they're tricked into this whole procedure and and can we talk about the Pitocin Mm -hmm. talk about the whole experience of like your typical you know gotcha type situation coming from the medical establishment uh, the model I guess well, there's definitely various ways, and as we already mentioned, women are feeling pretty vulnerable, especially at the end of their pregnancy. They're they're hurting. <laughs> They've had enough. 
And um, so it's easy enough to suggest this plan of why don't we just have you come in? Amandi Aman, why don't you come in and we'll we'll just kind of hook you up to the IV and we'll do Take this Pitocin and we'll um, get things going for you. And it's 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 okay if, it, if it's uncomfortable for you, you can just go ahead and get an epidural. And from that point onward, once it's not even the Pitocin. Pitocin is brutal. It's, it's not at all, we call it a synthetic oxytocin, but it's not at all like our body's hormone oxytocin. It is constant. You ask any woman who's had birth without, and birth with, and it's night and day. And so when this is in your IV medication, it's not like you're having surges, it's like you're having constant discomfort. Mm -hmm. And that's not the way labor was designed. It's not designed that way both for your, for the woman's perspective and for her um, being able to cope with it, but also for the babies being able to cope with it. Um, there's just, there's no there's no resting tone in the uterus when Pitocin is in the in the format. So inevitably that, that leads to more help, help, help from the baby. And this is, you know, the common scenario where we are, of course, having the woman on the, the continuous fetal monitoring and we see the heart tones go down and inevitably we rush to get the baby out and then we save the baby, right? We mm -hmm. created all those things and then we go save the baby. So that's, then that's what one thing that can lead to the cesarean birth. And that's what you're talking about. But also women are led down that path fear of going through the discomfort because they've talked to other women they've they listen to what their doctor says and, and still is the the standpoint or the um the belief system in in our miracle uh, american um, medical association and also acog that women can have an elective surgery not even have to have a medical indicator for birth and just simply say well, okay. Here, here's they don't give again all the informed consent. They don't say, hey, you can have a you can have an out of hospital birth. You can have, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can go have a birth in, in that tent over there, and you can have an induction with me. And oh, by the way, you can just have a C-section. They don't really give them all of the choices. They give them some of those. They give them the hospital. Choices. They give them the hospital choices. And um, for women that are completely, they've they've so gone there to the, that place of fear, you can't bring them back. Um, that's going to sound pretty appealing, especially if you're giving the big sell, and especially if you don't tell her that automatically that's four times the risk of, of just giving it the try, giving it the, the vaginal birth try. And what I think is interesting, you said they, they, they'll go, they'll talk to other women about the pain. Mm -hmm. But my, my wife said, and I think even, I think Mandy, I've heard Mandy and Elizabeth talk about this. After you gave the birth, after, I mean, how long was Mandy in labor with Wesley? Like really hard. It was several. It was long, like twenty some hours, wasn't it? Well, it. it well, I think it was. Uh, I mean, she, when she got to the hospital, she was nine centimeters dilated. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it was. She wrote it out all through the night, probably from she about beautifully. Probably from mm -hmm. about dinner time that night to, I think we got to the hospital at like, probably. 6 a.m. 7 or 7 a.m. something like that early in the morning um, when the sun was kind of just coming up so um, I don't know mm -hmm. that was labor right so. yeah mm -hmm. um, I, Elizabeth was much shorter she started the night before she didn't really complain that much when we got to the hospital she was six centimeters within three and a half hours Almost four hours later, Anna was born, and she only had to push for 16 minutes. Beautiful. But um, I've heard them talk about that after all of that that they went through, and Mandy obviously went through a much longer duration than Elizabeth did with Wesley versus Anna, um, but that feeling that they got afterwards, they talked about, it was like, it didn't matter how much pain they got. They, they forgot almost That's instantly. Right. It was just... It was this incredible feeling. I can't describe it. I mean, I didn't feel it. I'm just kind of repeating it's what I've, I've heard. Um, and that's, but they yeah. don't talk about that. Why? Mm -hmm. You know, why? Why aren't we talking about that? That feeling yeah. that, that that those women get. Why aren't they told about that? Your body literally. There's the, the, because there's they, a chemical they earned that it. released. Yeah. They earned it. They they did what God designed them to do. Right, but these women are going on and on about, oh, the pain is horrible, and da da da. And I went through. Yeah. Well, why don't you tell them about after the kid was out? Well, of course, the women who, uh, what you're saying, I think, mm -hmm. is that, you know, they had, even just having an epidural in place, even if you end up with a vaginal birth, there's a disruption there. So mm -hmm. um, I can tell you, having been there, d seen that, witnessed it, that 
um, those women don't get that that rush mm-hmm. of emotions. They're right. they're pretty flatlined, and it's because they've got something chemically blocking that response mm-hmm. to them. I'm not saying that they won't still be able to bond with their babies, but mm-hmm. there's a disruption there, mm-hmm. and um, it, it really it has to do with the endorphins. Endorphins are the feel good hormone Mm -hmm. well your body says you got that wire in your back that little thread that's called Mm -hmm. you know hooked up with the epidural i don't need to be producing those endorphins you've got Mm -hmm. something else that's sort of i don't know what it's doing but i don't i don't need to come up with that Mm -hmm. and that all of that that chemical cocktail that is supposed to happen in their bodies is being blocked and to me that's what i was making that point earlier is that that is then affecting that parenting that that next step which is what we're all leading up to folks this is you know where we're all heading with this mm-hmm. um that's that's caused a disruption mm-hmm. and so it, it but yeah they know they don't until unless they've seen it themselves they're probably and unless maybe they've experienced it in one way and then the other they're not going to know about it and um it, certainly physicians are not going to be selling mm-hmm. that you know so, and the reason I, the reason i put it that way is I was assuming that they they finished the birth, you know, they did it all natural. I worked with a woman her her first child, Caitlin, last year. Mm-hmm. She did it, and she said for, from then out the rest of her kids, she did the epidural because she hated it so much. Mm, and in my mind, I'm bad. going after yeah. the fact, you know, this is before our daughter was born. I'm going. I don't understand. You experienced that. But did she? I mean, we don't know the whole story though. That's like, true. As far as did they do pitocin? Did she try to stick it out? She and, was induced. That is brutal, and so she she was kind of she was cheated in a big way. She doesn't even know what it would have been like without that. Right. So, honestly, pitocin sucks. And so, I, if 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 that was what <laughs> if that was what labor was really if that's what God's design, what I would be like, whoa, God, what what's up with this? Mm-hmm. But but that, of course, it's not what he intended. There's there's a. Uh, you know, a wave effect that the uterus does, not this constant jabbing that the Pitocin creates. And so if that poor soul, that's all she experienced, she's probably like, I'm really not looking forward to going there again. Mm -hmm. So she just, she didn't know. A a short story, a quick story on inducing. My mother-in-law with her second oldest after Elizabeth Benjamin, she went to the hospital over over here about um, an hour away. I'm not going to give the name for location's sake. Uh, she went over there, and she'd been in there for about you know an hour and a half. She was like three centimeters, and um, the doctor came in and he was talking to her and going, "Well, you might make it to the night, you might not." And he kept looking at his watch. And my hmm. father-in-law asked him, "What? Is hey, something wrong?" Somewhere. And he said, "Well, I've got dinner plans with my wife tonight." Yeah. So he left for about forty uh-huh. minutes and comes back, and we got to get this baby out. Let's induce. Yeah. And they, they, were, yeah. they were, and my, my mother-in-law, after having all the rest of her kids, said there was no reason that he should have had to induce her mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He said there was no medical reason. Just the um, medical time clock. Yeah. yeah. It was horrible. Yeah. Um, and she, she he, he was born within the hour or so, mm-hmm. after they induced her or mm-hmm. something like that. Oh, boy. Um, it was... Quick. Yeah. yeah that's, that's... It was again. really painful. Yeah. From what she said, so... Anyway, um, I think to... Do you have anything else, Sam? Uh, I mean, I have a lot of stuff written down, but mm-hmm. it's stuff that we talked about last week, and I'm really not... I feel like we... We've covered a lot. This is a really good interview. Okay. I'm really happy with so, it. So, to wrap it up, you, you had said when we were talking about the vaccines and the GMOs, to, to wrap it up, what can we do about it? Let's let's end on that note, because you had brought yeah, that up. the positive. The big, big thing is to get with legislation and and monsanto the company that you didn't know about that is very Mm -hmm. powerful in this situation is also blocking at the the lobbyist standpoint from foods being labeled and so we need to make sure that all the citizens clamor around and say we need to know what's in our food that Mm -hmm. that's a biggie and that is something that's very doable but and before that happens have have your own garden uh Mm -hmm. belong to a csa uh, if if not that, then at least buy Stop all organic. Stop supporting the stores. 